I appreciate everybody joining me this morning. Uh, this is the nine millionth webinar I've done since COVID started. Uh, we've made these now monthly webinars. It's the first Thursday in every month, the first Thursday in every month. So here we are, June 3rd, the first Thursday in June. Um, and the topic I want to talk to you all about is discovery, which is something that my office, my team, our lawyers and paralegals have really been reevaluating what we think, why we think it, what we do, how we do it. I mean, truly over the last three months, I would say, we have made a very purposeful and concerted effort to really think about why we're sending discovery, what we hope to accomplish, and is it working? And I'll tell you right off the bat, uh, everybody has these webinars, they tell you everything I do is great. I've been killing it. This case I've settled, I'm sending this discovery, it's awesome. We have been doing discovery wrong, at least I have. I have been doing discovery wrong for 10 years. That's basically what I figured out over the last three months. And I think the reason I figured that out is because I've started asking myself, why the hell am I doing this? Why do I send interrogatories at the beginning of the case? Why do I send requests for production? Why? So if you bear with me here, I try to make these as practical as possible and give you takeaways and things that you can do leaving this webinar, you can do this afternoon. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to give you things that you can take action steps to hopefully improve your practice and win more cases. But for this webinar, and I can't think of any, ones, any other ones I've really done this, I want to start with the premise of, of why. So for 10 plus years, I have been sending discovery along with complaints. Um, even when I, or when I did defense work, I sent discovery with my answer. In fact, sometimes I would send discovery before I answered in the defense world because then I'd get my discovery responses before uh, mine were actually due. If you do the timing, defense lawyers, if they send discovery right away once their client is served, they can actually get their responses back before that 40 day, 45 day mark. So it's just been ingrained in me and it's, I imagine it's been ingrained in a lot of you, maybe most, maybe all of you, that you get a case, whatever side you're on, and you send discovery. That's what you do. Over the last couple years, discovery has become bullshit. It's just become a nonsense game of uh, what can the other side not tell you? How many objections can they make? And how long can the discovery process actually take without anyone sharing meaningful information? I, I don't know about you guys, but I spend way too much time, way too much time arguing about, did you actually answer my question? Like, I mean, an interrogatory, where did you live? I've been, I've gotten objections, objections to where do you live? I've gotten objections to, do you have any photos from the crash, a basic car accident? Like when you rear-ended my client, did you get out of your car and you, did you take any photos? And I can't even get clear answers to that. I, I don't know if you guys are having the same experience I am, um, but what I've tried to do over time is the first thing I tried to do was if, hey, if I don't object, maybe they won't. So we basically have a rule in my office that unless there is some devastating piece of information or some very important attorney client privilege um, communication or work product, we do not object. We just answer the question. You know, even things that we don't think are, are discoverable. Uh, we have a wrongful death case right now where the defense really wants to know what my client's life insurance policy was. I have no idea why that makes any difference, but it was $50,000. I'm just going to tell you. So I tried to do that. That didn't work. Defense lawyers, they're not, it's not a tit for tat. They are not. And I'm trying to take away squeaky toys from my dog. No, but no squeaky today. Mr. Whatever this guy is squeaks. Um, so I tried like a tit for tat. I tried, hey, if I, uh, if I don't object, maybe they won't. That didn't work. We tried not sending discovery at all. We've tried that and that hasn't worked because we do need, <laughs> here's your squeaky toy, because we do need certain information. So especially over the last couple of months, we've really focused on what do we need? When do we need it? And how are we going to get it? 
So right now, for example, Chris Stokes in my office is not in my office because he's out in Gainesville taking a deposition of a records custodian for a big uh, car manufacturer, tow truck type company or car parts manufacturer. So the reason he's doing that is because we've changed our theory to be, let's get the information we need from the defendant, not from the lawyers. What we are trying to do is cut out the middleman because the middleman in my world, the defense lawyers, stop us from getting meaningful discovery and stop the case from moving. I mean, think about the process. I send discovery and it gets answered. I read the discovery. Maybe that takes me a week. I read the discovery. I write a 6.4 letter for efficiency, by the way. Don't just read the discovery and then write the 6.4 letter. Read the discovery and write the 6.4 B letter at the same time. That way you only have to look through the discovery once. But anyway, you send that letter. You tell them, hey, respond in 10 days. They don't respond in 10 days. You say, hey, can you respond in 10 more days? Maybe they do. Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, their response is, we stand by our objections. It's like, what, what, the, fuck? what the hell was the point of making this? Man, squeaky toy today. What was the point of me, of me writing this long letter? You're not going to change. You're not going to change what you do. So you're left with the same stuff and it's been a month. You then write your motion. Maybe that takes you two weeks by the time you get around to doing it. You then file it. They get a month to respond. You maybe file a reply. Then you wait for a hearing. Congratulations, you've spent three or four months, maybe longer, of discovery without getting any information. Why? Why does that happen? That's, it happens because in my world, defense lawyers don't answer discovery. They just object. I'm sure there's plaintiff's lawyers who do it too. But from what I see from my perspective, it's that defense lawyers don't respond to discovery. They're not trying to share information. So how do we stop that? We cut the defense lawyer out of it. So when we file a complaint now, what we've started doing is not sending, not sending extensive discovery. I think there are certain things you want to know. You know, in an interrogatory, I think you always want to know are you blaming anyone else? Are there any non-parties you think need to be added to this lawsuit? Because I, I don't want to find out six months later that, oh, you think somebody should have been added and my statute of limitation ran or something. Um, I want to know, you know, do you know anything about my client's past history? Do you have anything on my client about criminal acts, medical records, treatment history? Do you have any of that stuff? But even in a basic motor vehicle crash, I've always asked in an interrogatory, tell me what happened, what happened in the crash? We have two questions, I think. One is tell me everything that happened from the moment you, wake, you woke up until the crash, and then tell me what happened immediately before the crash, the impact, and immediately after. And literally all I get is a defense lawyer saying what they did when they woke up in the morning is irrelevant and not discoverable. And then part two is I'm not going to... I'm not going to tell you anything about what happened in the crash except in the police report. Well, shit, I already have the police report. I already know what it says. Even if you get a valid response to how did the crash happen, that response is crafted by the lawyer in conjunction with the client. So the client says, you know, I was going for 40 miles an hour and 25 and I rear-ended that person. I guarantee you the defense lawyer is going to take out the 40 miles an hour part. They're going to say, oh, it was a rear-end crash. I don't want the defense lawyer story. I don't want the perfect words written by someone who does this every day. I want to hear it directly from the defendant. So the first thing that we've started doing is taking out the middleman. And the way that we do that is we don't send discovery that asks the actual defendant to provide us information. I've stopped asking even the basic stuff. I don't care where the defendant lives, where they worked. I don't care where they went to school. Uh, for the most part, I don't care. And I can get that in, 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 uh, in depositions. So along with our complaint, we've started noticing more and more depositions, whether it's uh, a safety director in a truck crash, whether it's the defendant, which we've kind of always done, um, whether it's scene witnesses, police officers, whatever it is, there's no rule that says you have to go defendant first, then plaintiff or plaintiff, then defendant, then fact witnesses, then experts. 
that's not true. Just absolutely not true. Everybody goes like that, typically for costs and ease. But it, at the beginning of the case, you, as the plaintiff's lawyer at least, you know more information than the defense. The reason is because the defense probably hasn't talked to their client. You've known about this case for however many months or weeks, whatever it is, before you filed. You have a good relationship with your client. You've done all the investigative work you can do without filing a lawsuit, open records requests, getting the dash cam, the body cam, whatever it is. You have a knowledge advantage at the beginning of the case. So use that knowledge advantage to take depositions and get the information you want. The deposition Stokes is taking, we have a knowledge advantage. In fact, I actually, I'll give you a better example. I took one last week with my boy Hilliard Castillo, who canceled the deposition or threatened to to stop the deposition three different times. Thanks, Hilliard. Um, but I had dash care body cam video of his client and he didn't. You're probably thinking to yourself, how the heck did he not have that? Well, here's why. We filed the lawsuit and we noticed the deposition immediately. They send us discovery. We send them very limited discovery. They say, hey, we need more time to respond to your discovery. That's fine. That's because they hadn't talked to their client, but that's fine. And they go, okay, we'll move the deposition for you. And I said, no, I don't want to move the deposition. I'll take the deposition of the defendant without the discovery responses. That was their response. They went, really? I said, yeah, we don't need to move the deposition. And what did I do? I took my interrogatories on a piece of paper and I copied and pasted them into a different Word document and then asked those same exact questions directly to the defendant. And I did that because my discovery wasn't due yet. So when they asked for videos, photos, and all that of the scene, and I, I don't know if in that situation, honestly, if I would have produced it, I might've made an objection saying it's equally available to you. I don't know what I would have done, but I didn't have to do that because they didn't send discovery quick enough. So I got to depose this defendant and I had the wealth of knowledge. My wealth of knowledge was much greater than theirs. So I'm asking the defendant, hey, did you ever tell the police officer, quote, I wasn't in a crash, end quote? or quote, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't hit that car, end quote. And Hilliard is looking at me like, what are you talking about? How do you have these quotes? Obviously his client's saying, nope, never said that. Never said that. Well, I have direct quotes because I have the dash cam or body cam footage and you don't. You guys didn't go get it. And that's because I'm taking the deposition 45 days after I filed the complaint. And even if they went and got it, I mean, it's, it's an APD case. You're not getting that body cam or test cam footage in 45 days with APD unless, unless you know somebody can pull some strings. So I'm able to, to have a knowledge gap and use that to my advantage. Now, the other thing that happens is that you also wanna be able to find the information that you need. Um, we have another case, for example, where uh, we think emails are going to be very important. It's an apartment complex shooting case. Our client was killed and we have a, uh, we have a, a, a big company, many different layers of, 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 of sub companies and holding companies. And we think they all communicate amongst each other. We, at least that's what we thought. And we now know that. But we made the mistake of asking the defense lawyer, hey, do you have any emails? And he says, no, my client doesn't have any emails. We asked that in a, in a request for production. Well, come to find out, there are emails. How did we find it out in this case? Well, we took a 30B6 of the records custodian of the defendant. When you think of records custodian depositions, you generally think of depositions of medical providers, um, depositions of you know, non-parties that haven't certified that their, their evidence was correct. Forgive me for one second. Let's go. Um, but we took a, a, we did a 30B6 notice and took the 30B6 witness for the person who had the most knowledge of records. How do you keep the records? What are the records? Where do you store them? How easy is it to get? Um, when can you give them to us? So we get this guy who's a company man. He doesn't give two craps about, uh, about the lawsuit. I mean, he's like their tech guy. And we say to the tech guy, hey, do you guys have any emails? And he goes, yeah. Where do you store them? On computers, servers? Do you, how long do you keep them? Oh, we, we always keep them. 
what happens when an employee leaves? Do you, and you, do you, what do you do with their email account? Well, we deactivate it, but we can turn it back on at any time. And keep in mind, the defense lawyer has told us to this point, hey, sorry, so-and-so and so-and-so, their email accounts were deleted slash deactivated. We can't get to that information. Well, Ted in IT says otherwise. And Ted, Ted in IT, he's there to help us because Ted in IT can pull these emails right away. So looking back, I wish we would have just skipped the, the request for production and just um, and just ask Ted, you know, go and ask the person who's the best employee for the defendant to give you the information. If you have a corporate defendant, skip the defense lawyers and go and ask the company. You can do this through a 30B6 or even a 30B1. A 30B1 deposition is when you don't know the name of the person, but you can identify them by their title or job description or something. So you can say, I want the 30B1 of the technology officer, if it's a big enough company. You can say, I want a 30B6 of these topics, if, it's a, uh, if that works for you. And I'll share, I'm happy to share with y'all, um, I'll put it in the email that I send out, the 30B6 notice that we sent um, to this company for those records. So what it does is we get the information from the horse's mouth and every single time that we've done that, and I tell, I've told you this is, a, a, this is something we're working on to better our practice and get better information. But every single time we've done it, we've gotten better information than if we just would have asked the defendant through the defense lawyer. So my first takeaway here is I want you guys to, uh, and this is the hard part of the job, it's thinking, right? That if, if machines could do our job, They'd be doing it already. We have one of the few jobs that I think require us to think, require us to, to use strategy and, um, and adapt, adapt to what's happening. And right now, what I'm suggesting that you do is you adapt how you do discovery. Ask yourself before you send discovery the next time, why am I doing this? Am I going to get the best information that I can? So start with these questions, I guess. What do I want to know? Like, what do I actually want to know? We've started taking out discovery requests that we don't think are important, mainly because I don't want to spend the time reading them. Like I, I looked at, you know, we have 35 interrogatories, 36 interrogatories that we send out in a standard car accident case. I don't give two shits about at least 15 of them, but I sit there and I read the 15 every time the discovery comes in. Well, I don't want to do that. So I've removed the ones that I don't think matter at all. I then ask myself, what information do I want? And part two is, where can I get that information the best? Where can I get it where it's going to be the most accurate, the most honest, the most efficient, the least costly? Um, you know, the, the truth is in our job, at least on the plaintiff side, if you close cases quicker and close them for more money than you could otherwise, you're killing it. You're doing the best you can do. So the two things on my mind with this discovery stuff now is how can I make my case stronger and how can I do it quicker? And if we, you look at that timeline that I kind of laid out where, you know, you go through sending discovery, a 6.4 letter, probably an extension or two to respond, a motion, a response, a court hearing. I mean, all that you're four or five months in, whatever it is, I can take a deposition 30 days after I file the lawsuit, 60 days, whatever it is, I can take it 30 days into discovery and I'm going to get much better responses. It's infuriating to me. I don't know if y'all have ever thought about this. It's infuriating to me that I will ask a question in an interrogatory and I will get four objections and I'll read the response and I won't know, do I have all the information? Are your objections meaningful? Are you actually withholding stuff? I can ask that same question word for word in a deposition and I will not get an objection. And it's so infuriating because I'll look at the lawyer and go, you know, you object to this four different ways when I wrote it on a piece of paper. Why aren't you objecting to it in person? Literally ask that question. And the reason is, and I'm going to stereotype and group defense lawyers and hell all lawyers together. People are lazy. People are lazy. Some and, and nothing wrong with paralegals or who handles discovery either, but some paralegal or some lawyer who doesn't give two craps is copying and pasting responses. And they know every time they've been asked this question for the last however many years, 
they've responded by saying objection, 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 objection. But they're not, I don't want to use the word smart. They're not whatever enough, quick enough, smart enough. Uh, they don't believe their objections enough that they're going to make them in person at a deposition. You can get away, and I probably even shouldn't say get away. You can ask far, 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 much more many questions. Those were, that wasn't English. But you can ask many questions in a deposition and not be objected to. But if you write them down on a piece of paper, you're going to get objected to. So cut out the middleman. So you're going to ask yourself, what do I want to know? Where's the information? How do I get it? And how do I get it as fast, as quick, as cost effective, as efficient, as honest as I can? Um, I want to give you another example of how to get some information. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday about this. And in a case that he has against a major retailer, he had sued a few employees. And I asked him, you know, did you do that for venue? Because if you have a, uh, an out of state company, for example, and you want to keep diversity jurisdiction, you want to keep somebody from Georgia on the defense side, because your clients from Georgia, and you don't want to be removed to federal court, a lot of times you'll sue an employee. So that way diversity gets destroyed. And I said, you know, did you do that for venue? And he said, no, I, I just, I just always add them. And I think a lot of people do that. You always add, you know, the store manager or the general manager or whoever, the person that you think was negligent. What that does though, is that causes the defendants that the employee defendants, especially if they're former employees to get a lawyer. So you have a former employee who used to manage a store and you sue that person when you don't need to, when you don't need to, that person is now going to be represented by defense counsel, by the insurance defense counsel. Yet if they were in a former employee who wasn't sued and is not a defendant, you may then be able to go and talk to that person directly because they aren't represented and you're able to under the, the professional rules. So uh, it's another example of think about what you're doing before you do it. Don't just do it the way it's always been done. I'm gonna take a real quick breather. I think I got a question. I do not, let's see. Just trying to read the comments. If you guys have questions or comments, if you put them, even if it's just comments, if you put them in the questions and answer tab, it's a, just a little easier for me, just the way this always works. Here you go. Danielle said, we always ask for the social security number, but we can't think of how we have used it. <laughs> um, uh, let's use social security number as an example. You can use it to run a background check, but if you can't do that without the social security number, you need a new background check company slash software. You know, you can run a background check with somebody's name, with their phone number, which in a car crash, you generally know from the police report. One thing we've started doing is, and I'll, I'll get back to social security numbers. One thing we've started doing is, you know, the police report has the defendant's name and it has the uh, phone number. So if you run a background search on the defendant, um, including their phone number, you can usually find out very easily who the cell phone provider is. So we send out a subpoena for the cell phone records as soon as the case gets filed and we serve that subpoena with the complaint, we serve that subpoena with the complaint which again gives me a knowledge gap, makes me know more than them because I'm hopefully gonna get that response within 30 days and I'm gonna be able to use that before they ask for anything in discovery. And notice most times defense lawyers don't in their discovery ask for, their, for you to give them their own clients, the defendant's cell phone records. So if I have the cell phone records, a lot of times they're not even asking me for them now I have to produce them because they're a non-party document, but you know, I don't need to produce them in one day before a deposition, especially if you know, I can use it for impeachment and the law is a little iffy on that. So you know, be careful. That's a conversation for the, another day, whether something's purely uh, impeachment or not. Generally, my belief is if it's purely impeachment, you need to produce it. If it's purely impeachment, you need to produce it. If it's used for multiple purposes, oh, excuse me. If it's purely impeachment, you do not need to produce it. You do not need to produce it. But if it's used for multiple purposes, then you do. That's generally my belief. But getting back to social security numbers, we don't give social security numbers. 
all it is is a government issued ID that has ID number that has nothing to do with the case. It's a library card number. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Now we agree to avoid the, the, the conflict that comes up where the defense lawyer says, why won't you give the social security number? We always get it. No one ever objects. We say, we'll give it to you after the case is over. So you can use it for Medicare, Medicaid reporting or whatever you need to do, but you don't need our client's social security number. Um, that's my take on social security numbers. It's the same thing as why do I care where you lived 10 years ago? Why do I care where you worked 10 years ago? Why do I care where you went to high school? Now, I may ask that just because I want to qualify the jury and see, hey, did anybody else go to Cherokee High School here? But I can just ask the jury and jury selection. Does anybody know, know the defendant? Does anybody know him? I, I don't need to spend interrogatory time or number, especially in federal court where you only get 25 interrogatories. So part one, and I'm going to get to part two in a second here. Part one is what I want you all to think about is why are you just doing it because you're doing it? Why are you just sending those requests because you have them in a form document and they go out and you get the information sometimes? What I would suggest to you is by doing that, by doing what I've done for the last decade plus, by just sending discovery to send discovery because that's what everybody does, I've made my job harder because I, I'm just asking to fight about objections in written discovery. I've prevented myself from getting information as quickly as I can. Um, and I've made my job more challenging. I, I, it's more frustrating. I, I, the first lawyer I ever hired, the reason I hired that person was because I never wanted to do anything with written discovery ever again. That hasn't exactly happened, but I want y'all to know, I hate written discovery because it's so inefficient and it doesn't make any sense. So part one is reevaluate. What are you doing? Why are you doing? I encourage you the next time you whip out those interrogatories and those requests for production, ask yourself on each one, spend the time, the one time, the next time you do it, go through each one and say, should I ask this in a written form or should I not? And if the answer is no, where can I get the information in a better fashion? Whatever that means to you in your case. Um, this also means you probably need to reevaluate it in every case. You know, a car accident is going to be different than a truck accident. A truck accident is going to be different than a slip and fall. Slip and fall is going to be different from a product liability case. Um, the bigger the company, the bigger the company I've learned, the more obstructionists they hire as defense lawyers. You know, General Motors is hiring lawyers who have a special degree that I, I didn't know exists in how not to respond to discovery. But generally, an insurance defense lawyer who works for Allstate, yeah, they're going to object, but they're just doing it because that's what they do. And they're not thinking about it. So if you outthink these people, you're going to do a great job. So let's get to part two. Part two is, how do you use written discovery then later in the case? And I think the answer is, you're using written discovery after you've learned where the information is. So let's use a truck crash. My typical discovery will say, my old discovery would say, did you have a black box and an EDM, a data recorder? Uh, where's the data? What did it show? I'll say, where's your driver qualification file for the defendant driver? That's the thing under the federal motor carrier safety rules you have to have for every qualified driver who's driving a commercial vehicle for you. I'm typically asking for maintenance records. Uh, you know, all those things that you ask for. What I'm doing instead is I'm using part one. I'm saying, you know, it's not best to ask the defense lawyer this. And even if the defense lawyer will give me the driver qualification file, I don't know if I necessarily want him to have it. I don't know if I want him to have it right away. Because if the lawyers only, for the most part at least, defense lawyers are only getting information because the plaintiffs ask for it. If you don't ask for X, they're not going to go to their client and ask the client, give me X. So sometimes I don't want the defense lawyer to have the driver qualification file because then, in this instance, they can prepare the driver. They can prepare the driver. So what, I, what we've started doing and what I think is a better approach subject to change is we wait on sending that written discovery. We will depose the safety manager or the person in HR, whoever it is, maybe both, and we'll ask, tell us about the driver. What information do you have on the driver? 
Do you run background checks? Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you do go through the whole federal motor care safety rules, all, the whole list of what's supposed to be in the driver qualification file. Um, tell me about how you hired the driver. Tell me about all this. And you're going to find out where all the information is. You know, Deborah from HR or Stan, the safety manager is going to say, well, we keep the driver qualification file here. Yes. We run a background check every year, a driving, uh, a driving background check. Um, we certify the drivers with our insurance company. We send the driving records reports to the insurance company. They send it back to us. You know, Steve in maintenance is going to tell you, yeah, we keep the records for the truck here. There's yearly checkups. There's monthly checkups. Um, there's all these records. And you're going to find out where everything is. But you're not going to have it. So part two of this way of doing it is to then use your discovery, your written discovery requests to ask for the information. So think about how this works. Let's compare the two different tracks we could go through. We say in a standard case right now, or at least a couple months ago, we would say in a trucking case, um, please give us all of the driver's all the driving history you have for the driver who rear-ended our client. Give us all the background checks. And we would typically get uh, a response like, we object that the background checks for however many years ago are not discoverable, our client doesn't have them, um, but here's some random ones for certain years. And then we have to send the 6.4 letter and say, hey, you guys have to have more of them, you're required to have, you know, depending on the, the, the type of truck it is, you're required to have this many over this many years and so on. And that's just a nonsense game you have to play. So that's, that's one way to do it. That's your traditional way. The other way is you go to Stan in a depot and you say, Stan, do you guys keep driver qualification files? He says, yes, of course. You say you're required to keep all the, uh, all the records showing, you know, when you ran background checks and when you ran driver histories. Oh yeah. And do you keep those? Yep. Where do you keep them? In the filing cabinet over there. Okay, easy. is it easy to pull those out? Yeah, it's really easy. And that's an important question to ask if you're going to do it this way. Is, is it easy to ask for, or easy for you to get that information, especially in an IT kind of setting when you're talking about ESI, electronically stored information. And if things aren't electronically stored now, it's, I'm stunned. I mean, think about your office, at least mine, almost everything if not everything is electronically stored. It may, we may have a paper copy of something, but it's electronically stored. It's been saved on a server, on a computer, emailed, whatever. So when you're talking to the IT guy, a really important question specifically for him is to ask, hey, how easy, it is, how easy is it for you to search the emails for the word in a negligent security case? Or let's keep it a truck case. How easy is it for you to search the word unqualified? He'll say, oh, it's pretty easy. If you ask that in a written discovery response, you're going to get the, it's unduly burdensome. And uh, if in federal court, you're going to get that the uh, proportional needs are outweighed by, you know, and so on. If you can get, cut out the middleman and get the actual defendant say, yeah, it's really easy to find that stuff. Do it all the time. What's the objection going to be? Because then you're going to send the written discovery response that says, and it has to be, I would suggest making it very specific. You say, like Steve in IT said, please produce the records that are contained in the server, which you keep in the storage room that has this information that he said would be easy to find. <laughs> How are they going to object to that? You know, uh, and take it out of the ESI context. If it's a paper copy, you know, Brenda and HR said all driver qualification files are kept in the storage closet. Please produce the driver qualification file for John Doe that is contained in the storage closet. And you're going to get what you actually want and you're going to get it much, much easier. Uh, Parker asked, uh, who do we use for background checks? We just use TLO. Um, we have a, we use TLO or we use uh, Westlaw to go through. Um, you know, the truth is on background checks, uh, at most, maybe you're going to find some claims history. I mean, you can run a claims history as well um, and find out prior crashes and all that. Uh, but for most, at least motor vehicle crashes, crash cases, unless it's a trucking case where, you know, you have some sort of driver disqualification issue where you think the driver shouldn't have been hired or shouldn't have been retained. 
that stuff really doesn't matter. You know, who cares if the person was in a crash three years ago? Um, yeah, maybe they're even dishonest about it, but again, who cares? So, but we use the background check to run a, an ISO claims report sometimes, or just to find them, make sure we're in the right venue uh, to get the cell phone information, find out any criminal convictions um, and arrests. We'll use that as well. Those are some things we use it for. So hopefully that answered your question, Parker. Um, if you guys have questions, by the way, uh, please drop them in the question and answer. So we got part one of, of why am I just sending written discovery? Part two is how am I going to find it then in a better way? And you're just going to ask the source. You're going to ask a source. The, the way I, I treat this now is and I don't have any kids, but if you guys have a messy teenager or something at your house and you're trying to find, you tell your messy teenager, um, hey, I really need to find this t-shirt to bring you. Your kid's at soccer practice and says, you know, mom, dad, I really need that gray t-shirt that says, you know, whatever the school name on it is. Can you please bring it to school? At least that was me as a kid. Mom, can you please find my math book? I think, I think my mom is in this and I'm going to get shit later for that. I can't tell. But anyway, I, I, you know, I'd be like, Hey, can you please bring them my math homework? That's, that's in my math book that I left on my desk. And if my room was a complete mess, my mom is generally going to say, where is your math book? And I'm going to say, it's on my desk. And then she's going to say, I looked on your desk. I don't see it. And I'll say, oh, check under my desk. If you get good directions to find something, if you get good directions to find something, you're going to find it easier. And the best way to get good directions in this setting is to ask the source, to go to the person who has the most information about where the records are kept and ask and then go and get them. It creates two things. It's going to make you much, much more efficient. You're going to get the information you need quicker. And you're going to create that knowledge gap, which I think is extremely important because I've yet to have a situation where the defense lawyer in response to a deposition notice for a records custodian or a 30 B six about where do you keep the records? I've yet to have a defense lawyer who has properly, I shouldn't say properly, who has adequately prepared that witness to be able to respond to my questions. You know, Steve in IT is not a lawyer and he's not going to make objections. He's not going to try to hide the ball. He's a problem solver. That's why he's in IT. He solves IT problems. Um, but the lawyer has a really tough uphill battle to try to explain to Steve, hey, make it difficult on him. Steve's not going to do that. And it's also very difficult for the lawyer to find out where all the information is that we are going to eventually want because he's going to learn it for the first time during the deposition. And if you're going, if you're worried for some reason about, you know, preservation of evidence or spoliation, destruction of evidence, this is also going to make it much more clearly. Um, I started this deposition by telling you I've been doing discovery wrong for more than a decade. I'm going to give you another example of how I've done something wrong and how I do it differently. We have a case right now against massage envy. Our client was, was raped and sexually assaulted by a massage therapist. This was the second time he had done this. So we think we have a pretty strong case. Um, we've got Massage Envy franchising, the big, the big entity. We've kept them in the case. So frankly, I'm kind of proud of that, that they're still in the case. And then we have the local uh, store uh, as a defendant. And the lawyers in Massage Envy franchising, the, the big company, you know, the corporate entity, their lawyers are out in Arizona. And I think it's literally the only client they have. They go around the country only defending Massage Envy. So you talk about a knowledge gap. I have the reverse. You know, they those folks know everything there is to know about massage envy. This guy goes around the country just defending massage envy. So they've got way more knowledge than we do. And they know where things are and know, you know, if I don't ask for it in the specific exact way that they're not going to give it to me. So we did the traditional send discovery, try to get responses. And one thing that was really important to us was getting the customer list for everyone who's massage, who's massaged by this massage therapist. You know, maybe it's me, but I, I assume if you sexually assault two people in a short period of time, that there might be others. Um, so we wanted to know everybody that he'd ever massaged. In the meantime, while this lawsuit was going on, or while the case was going on, um, the location got sold. So we're, we have these written discovery responses where 
we've asked for the customer list and Massage Envious says we, says we don't have it. And then the location gets sold um, and then the court orders Massage Envy to produce the customer list to us. The problem now is Massage Envy doesn't have that customer list. Um, or at least they say they don't. They're, the new owners of that location have it. So even just me telling you all this to connect all the dots, it's kind of convoluted. I have to go through that. We sent a preservation of evidence letter. Here's what it said. We sent discovery. Here's what they should have kept. If I could go back in time to make the issue of now what's turned into destruction of evidence or failing to save evidence, to me, they're the same thing. If you don't fail, if you don't save it, then you've destroyed it. You don't actually have to rip it up. But we have this issue now where it's not as clean as it could be. You know, imagine if I would have deposed the records person, the person who knows the most about the customer list of the massage therapist names, last name is, is actually Smith. So I would, if I go back in time, I would have done a, a 30B6 notice for the person. And I would, one topic would have been um, the names and contact information of all the people who Mr. Smith gave massages to over this time span. And then when I would have gotten that person sitting next to me or sitting across from me in a deposition, I would have said, where do you keep the list? Is it hard copy? Is it, uh, is it online? Is it on your server? How easily searchable is it? What information do you keep? What do you know? Do you know the names, contact information, how many massages, the date of the massage, complaints, whatever. And I would have all that information. What's more difficult to do is to request that information in written discovery and then do the 30B6 notice and then do it, then find it out from the corporate representative. Because technically, technically, and Drew Ashby is more of an expert on this specific topic than I am, certainly. Um, Drew Ashby, you know, spends a lot of time dealing with products liability cases against major auto, you know, companies. And he deals with the problem of discovery about discovery. You cannot do, you cannot do discovery about discovery. So if you send interrogatories or requests for production and then want to ask a representative about how did you go and answer my interrogatories? How did you go and um, collect the documents that you eventually produced to us? A lot of times lawyers are going to let you ask those questions, but technically that is discovery about discovery and that is not allowed. So how do you prevent the discovery about discovery problem? You don't serve discovery. You don't serve discovery. You ask for the roadmap like you're my mom while I'm at school. You say to the defendant, where's your math book? If it's not there, then where is it? Where's this? Where's that? How do I get to it? How easy is it? And then you're not asking discovery about discovery. You're just discovering that information for the very first time. So that's why I encourage y'all um, to make sure that you are limiting your written discovery from the start because you could run into a problem with it. I haven't seen it in a non-products liability case um, where somebody says, look, I'm not going to tell you about the discovery and how we conducted it, but it makes sense. You know, once the lawyers get involved, all that communication is attorney client privilege or attorney work product. You know, if you send a discovery response that says, find this, the defense lawyer is going to go to their client and say, hey, find this. They're going to talk about it. You don't get to know any of that. So if you prevent that conversation from happening and you go around the lawyer and say, how would I find this? What information would be here? How would I get access to this information? Then you don't have that problem. Hopefully that makes sense, Joel. It's a, it's a, it's a tough topic that I'm actually relatively new. Um, I've learned you know, about relatively newly, if that makes any sense. Um, at this point, maybe I've told you some things that you know, maybe I've told you some things you don't know. Does anybody have any questions or want me to talk about anything? If not, I've got a few more minutes. I just want to wrap up, but I'll give you one second as I take a breath here um, and let me know if there's anything that's on your mind. Uh, if, if you have heard or haven't heard this before, I'd love to know what you think about it. If you have heard this before, I'd love to know if you're using it and how you're doing it. So that way we can all um, get better answers to discovery and get through the written discovery process as quickly, as efficiently, as effectively as possible. All right. The last thing I want to touch on then are requests for admission, which I do not believe are discovery, but I do want to touch on them. Um, there's a, a split here. I've got, 
Uh, I've got two questions. I'm going to pause on the request for admission. I'll get back to it. Um, Aaron mentioned that defense attorneys like to play gotcha with obscure information. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, and I, I think that we as plaintiff's lawyers or whoever, as lawyers requesting discovery, I think we need to be much more mindful of the language that we use to request things. For example, if we request emails, we are only going to get emails. For companies, at least, that I'm dealing with, you know, hell, my company, every company I know and every company I sue, people text each other. Um, people instant message, you know, they Teams or Skype message each other. There's a whole lot of ways to communicate now. And this is eventually going to lead to me saying, you may in the future consider trying to get records from, depending on the case, get records from personal cell phones of employees, defense employees, if they use the cell phone for job purposes, that's, that's the end of this. But with how often and how many different modes uh, and methods that people communicate, I think we need to be very specific in our language. You know, asking for emails, the defense lawyer is only going to give you emails. He's not going to give you something that was sent over Teams. He's not going to give you something that was, you know, a screen share. So I think we need to really expand our definition of you know, emails or communications or correspondence or whatever. I mean, technically correspondence is only things that are written. And I've had lawyers say to me, oh, I didn't give you that because that wasn't written. That was a voicemail. I'm like, a voicemail isn't correspondence. And you look up the definition of correspondence, which has been cited to me in a brief, and it is written. At least there's at least one definition out there that says written. So to prevent what Aaron's talking about with defense lawyers or whoever hiding obscure information or even information that's pretty obvious, we need to be very, very careful and mindful and purposeful about the language we use to request things. And that's also another reason why I think it's easier to find out where information is by doing a deposition because I don't have to use the perfect language in a deposition because I can try multiple times at the question. <laughs> I can you know, say, oh, I meant to say electronically stored information. The person will say, well, what does that mean? And then you can give them the whole host of, of definitions and you can get to the information you need. Um, Andrew asked, uh, for major cases, how quickly do you file and start this discovery process? Um, here's my lawyer answer, which is, it depends on the case, but that's a bullshit answer, Andrew. So let me give you something that's real. Um, I try to file as quickly as humanly possible because my belief is that, uh, and I think the truth is that information, evidence, somehow magically goes away the longer that time goes on. And of course, witness recollections, witness memories, they deteriorate over time. So when I think I have a major case, like you said, whatever that means, when I have a case that um, I think would benefit from filing suit right away. I'm very open and upfront with the client. I tell them right away, sometimes even at sign up, and I'll tell you a quick story in a second. I tell them, hey, I think I should file your case right away. You Usually I do a 33%, a 40% deal, 33% before suit, 40% after. Look, I'm not even gonna give you that deal. I'm gonna tell you it's 40% because I'm gonna file your case tomorrow or next week or whatever. Um, I have a case right now where um, a client of mine worked at, uh, he was a, a visual artist, a visual painter kind of for, um, for Paramount. And he was working in the Gwinnett Mall, Gwinnett Place Mall, which now I guess the outside is a parking lot for car dealers and the inside is often used for movie sets. I, I didn't know this. But he was painting the food court, which is a two or three story food court. He's painting the roof, the ceiling um, black. So that way they can use special effects. And um, Paramount brought in a company to remove all the lights. So that way, you know, if, if one of the painters touched the lights, they wouldn't be shocked. Unfortunately, while he's up in a huge scissor lift, you know, two, three stories high, he touches a wire, which he's totally supposed to touch. He's supposed to move the wire to paint around it. So everything's black and the wire's supposed to be off, but it's hot and he gets shocked. Um, the best way I can describe his injury, and this happened about three weeks ago, I'm looking at my calendar, three weeks ago. The best way I can describe his injury is he went from someone who talks like me, probably a little slower because I talk fast, but he went as a he he went from someone who you would never think 
had anything wrong with him because there wasn't anything wrong with him to now um, as if he has had a major stroke. You know, he can't formulate words. He can't formulate sentences. Um, and it's really, really devastating. We have a workers' compensation claim. We also have a, a third-party claim, uh, an injury claim against the electrical company that Paramount hired to do this. And in that case, um, to answer your question, Andrew, which is how quickly do we file and start the discovery process? Uh, we filed it immediately. We, I called the owner of the, of the electrical company immediately. I talked to him. Um, I recorded him. He was a complete asshole. Uh, he told me he's been shocked, you know, 10,000 times being an electrician. And this hasn't happened to him, so it can't be true. I'm like, okay. Um, so we jumped on it right away. And I expect that in the next two or three weeks, I will depose, um, you know, a records person from his company. I'll depose a safety manager. I'll depose the people that were actually supposed to go up in the ceiling and remove the lights. Do I know their names? No. But can I describe them well enough for a 30B1 or a 30B6 deposition? Hell yeah, I can. I don't need to know names. I don't need to know who the witnesses were. I can get that information without their names. So I start the process very, very quickly. Should you file all cases? No. Should you file all cases quickly? No. But in certain cases, I think you should. And you know that's an example of one of them that I think uh, will benefit from, act, from us acting very quickly. I generally, by the way, I think that people should file more cases um, when their clients are still treating. Because if you can get through the six-month discovery process and your client is treating through, during that time and then completes treatment, that aligns with, okay, six months of discovery is over. Hopefully, you've gotten everything you need. And your client is now done treating. It's the perfect time to settle the case. As opposed to client gets done treating, you try to settle the case pre-suit, it doesn't work. You then start the discovery process and you're spending six more months. Um, that's just my take on it. Um, Robert asked, do I video the custodian deposition? I video everything. I video every single deposition I take. I, I don't think I've taken a deposition without video I, literally in years. I, it does a few things. Um, and this is going to sound really nerdy and, and lame, but the number one reason we video things is I shouldn't say that I'm one. A, a very important reason that internally we video everything is that we can watch our videos and critique ourselves. You know, imagine if like, you know, Matt Ryan wasn't a, didn't have video of his games and couldn't watch tape and figure out should he have thrown that interception or not. You know, imagine if he couldn't do that. Um, that'd be crazy. You know, that'd be absolutely crazy. You know, the big gripe on Michael Vick all those years ago was that he never did film studies. Uh, there's a funny story that they gave him a, a DVD the Falcons coach at the time gave him a DVD that was blank and said, you know, hey, please go, you know, make sure you you uh, watch these videos, make sure you you learn these plays, and it didn't have anything on the CD. And he comes back in, you know, a couple of days later and goes, yep, I learned everything. And they're like, you know, hey man, you didn't even you didn't even pop in the video, obviously. But we want I want to be able to critique myself. I want to be able to look back at a video deposition I've taken and say, did I do a good job? What could I've done differently? And I want to show it to other people. On the, the client side and the case side, I think that videoing depositions is extremely, extremely important because how people say things and how they look when they say things um, really, really matters. Um, you know, we once had a, I, I tried a case where um, the defendant, one of the defense employees at least said that, and this is an extreme example, but said that the deposition was unfair because they were uh, they were not given a, a translator, an interpreter, I guess. They weren't given an interpreter and they didn't understand my questions. Well, I was able to pop in the DVD and say, you know, and show me asking the question in English and them responding in English with no trouble. Um, that really helped. I've had times where, you know, a client of mine uh, has said something and no matter how often you tell clients, don't be sarcastic, don't, you know, be, um, don't make snide remarks, they do. And, you know, you want to be able to show that, have that in your back pocket, that if they're going to bring up something, you know, some sarcastic comment, you can at least show it and show that it wasn't meant to be very realistic or to be taken, you know, for the truth. Um, so we video everything. I also think that videoing depositions, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, videoing depositions keeps generally, 
keeps lawyers in line. Um, it's much more difficult for a lawyer to be an asshole and, and be a jerk when they are on video and I can show that video to the judge. People behave when they're on camera. Just like when you walk in Target and you wave at the, the screen that shows that you're on video, you're, you're not gonna you know, scratch your butt or you know, I don't know, do something stupid in the aisle because you know you're on video. All right, the last thing, if there's no other questions, the last thing I wanna talk about really briefly then are requests for admissions. Um, like I said, I don't necessarily think they're discovery. In fact, I, I don't think they're discovery. Um, I think requests for admissions are used to narrow the issues at trial and discover, I use that word loosely, find out uh, positions of the other side. I am a big, big believer that when someone tells you something, whether it's a lawyer telling you, oh, my client said this, or whether it's a client, uh, whether it's a defendant saying something, I'm firm believer that you should go back and send a request for admission to ensure that answer is truthful. So defense lawyer says, yeah, my client says they don't have X or they write it in a discovery response. You know, the, we are not in possession of X. What I like to do is turn that into a request for admission, which a lot of those statements, by the way, are what's called admissions in judicio, admissions in judicio. If a statement is made in a written discovery response or a motion or a response to the motion, for example, in a motion, if Massage Envy says, we do not have those documents, say that in a motion to the court, it was actually a response to a motion to compel. If they say that, that is an admission in judicio. And what you can do, and I'll send you a template for how to, to create a, an admission in judicio, you can send those, send a request for admission essentially that says these things are already admitted. In a, in a, uh, a request for admission, you have to get them to say admit, deny, or I don't know. In an admission in judicio, you're just confirming and saying out loud, hey, you guys have already admit th admitted this. You're not asking for a response. So what I'm doing basically is keeping receipts. When somebody says something to me in a, um, in a non-official capacity, meaning a defense lawyer says my client says this, that's one degree removed. I want it directly from the defendant or someone in their personal capacity as a safety director, for example, the safety director says this says X. If it's not a 30B6, if it's not actually on behalf of the company, then I need to lock the company into that statement. So I take the statement, I make a request for admission, and I see if it's true or not. If I'm right, and if the people are being honest, then I get, yeah, admitted. If it's not, I get a denial, which is great, because then I have conflict, and I think conflict helps the value of cases most times. Um, or I get an I don't know, which doesn't make any sense. And then I say to the defense lawyer, how don't you know? Susan in IT said this was true or this wasn't true. You need to admit or deny it. Um, remember, by the way, when you are uh, trying to get clear answers or challenging the answers that the other side has given you for requests for admission, you are not moving to compel. You are moving to determine the sufficiency of the requests for admission, the responses. You are moving to determine the sufficiency of the responses. That is different. And that's why I believe that it is not that requests for admission are not discovery, um, that instead they are, uh, they are some other tool. Tim said he just had an issue with that. Anything you can send to simplify these admissions? Yeah, I, I think that you need to assume every admission that you write is gonna be read in open court. For example, we have a case right now where um, in some pleadings, the defendant said, we didn't know of any shootings. This is a shooting case I have, my client passed away. Um, the defendant said, we didn't know about any shootings. So we turned that into a request for admission and they confirmed it. Um, and I imagine at trial, now that there, we know there are multiple shootings and they know there are multiple shootings before ours. Um, I, at trial, I imagine I will stand up before I cross-examine the 30B6 witness and I will say, I'm gonna read an admission, something that the defendant says is true. I'm gonna read the defendant, and the sentence is actually, the apartment complex did not know of any shootings before the one in this case. 
I want to, I want that written in common English so the jury understands it. I don't want legalese. I don't want words that are defined by some definition that I'm not going to read. I want exact common speak, what I want the jury to hear. And then I'm going to go and start crossing that witness. And I'm going to, first question I'm going to say is, you heard what I said, right? And they're going to say, yeah. I'm going to say, but you guys know about shootings, right? That was a lie. And that's, that's my opening. That's going to be my, probably my first question in the case when we cross examine that witness. Um, but I'm going to do two things for you and remind me if I, if I promised y'all anything else. One thing I'm going to do is send you a um, admission in judicio. And the other thing I'm going to do, I know I promised something else. Somebody help me out. I promised, oh, I'm going to send you our uh, 30B6 notice, an example. It'll be in an apartment complex case because I, I think it's one of our better ones. But I'll send you the 30B6 for records and info. Um, you'll see the kind of things that we were asking for and how we went about it. Um, Aaron asked for a 30B1 notice. Aaron, all you want to do and anybody, all you want to do with the 30B1 is, is literally read um, the statute, which I believe says that all you need to do is, is sufficiently or reasonably, whatever the word is, identify the person. So you just want to say, whoever you're looking for, I want the person that was in charge of this, or I want the person who knows the most about this. That's more of a 30B6, but I want the person who's in this job title. So, you know, in a typical trucking case, you can say, I would like the person who is primarily responsible for the safety of this truck driver, the safety, you know, evaluating the safety merits. I want the person who's in charge of hiring this person. Those 30B1, those statements are going to be sufficient for a 30B1. All you want to be able to do is make sure that the defense can identify, knows who you're asking for. Bruce said, not as impeachment, that is just like a FRA admission. Bruce, help me out. I don't quite know what you're getting at, so forgive me. Um, the last thing, uh, oh, RFA. Not as impeachment, that is just like an RFA admission. Oh, I see, I missed one. So Bruce said, do you ever read a verified answer to an interrogatory in trial? Uh, yes, absolutely. What I also will consider doing is taking a verified answer and making that into a request for an admission if I want to change the answer to make it a little bit better for me. So the situation Bruce is talking about is you get this verified answer and you really like it. Um, if you really like it and don't want to mess with it, you can read that uh, in trial. I like to read things either right before. At first, I, I don't like to read much. I mean, you got to be, it has to be very short and punchy and straight to the point. Jury needs to be able to get it. So I read it right before I, I cross-examine a witness who is going to talk about that topic, or I typically do it at the end before I close my case in chief. I will read things. Um, maybe I've done it where I've read things that just didn't make any sense. You know, you've had 10 witnesses who all say X, and then I'll read the defense who's been, for the whole case, been saying Y. Or I've done it at the beginning of a case just to have... Um, just to have the jury know that certain things are not in dispute. Um, the last thing I'll tell y'all, and I'm going to start, I'm going to go back to where I started. I've been doing this wrong for more than a decade. Um, I, I, I believe that I, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and I wish I have done a lot of things differently, especially in this discovery context. We're all learning together. If you have good ideas, if you're trying something new, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Um, as I keep trying to figure this stuff out, I'll keep sharing it with you guys. I appreciate you spending the time with me. Um, thank you very, very much. I'll reiterate, as I said before I started this webinar, uh, I see some names on the list that I don't know. And if I don't know you, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you. Um, I'm driving to Charlotte this afternoon with a sleeping five-month-old who will not be a five-month-old dog who will not be sleeping at the time. So uh, I will be talking to a ton of people, just making calls, um, catching up with some people and, and uh, and talking to some of my friends. I'd love for y'all to be on my list. I put my email and my cell phone number. I'm gonna do it again in the comments. Here it is. There's my email and there's my cell phone number. I'm not saying it out loud because I don't want it on the internet. I just want you guys to have it since you joined me. Um, please know I'm here to answer all your questions. Um, and I, I really enjoy you know doing this once a month with you guys. 
if you have topic ideas, if you want me to talk about something, I'd love to. Um, hopefully I know something about it. So let me make sure I covered all the questions. I think I did. I think I did. I think I did. All right. So takeaways. One, question why you do it. Don't just do it because you do it. Number two, figure out what you actually need. Number three, really think, really think. That's why we get paid. Really think about how you can best get that information you need. Number four is go get it. Number five is confirm it if you need to through request for admission. And number six is always be adapting because if you keep doing the same thing and, and you keep you know, doing repeatable things that um, just because you've always done it, you're going to always get the same results. I think that we are getting incredibly um, better information in a more efficient and effective way because we're skipping the middleman. And uh, if you've been on the defense side, I think you'll realize that defense lawyers have a ton of work. And if you don't make them work on your case, they won't work on your case. And that's a benefit, I think, to us because we can gather a ton of information with that knowledge gap I keep talking about. If you have the knowledge and they don't, you can do a lot of things, a lot of things to improve your case, either behind the scenes or outwardly um, that will make your settlements larger and make them happen quicker. Name of the game, settle the case for more, settle the case quicker, and you will uh, make clients happy. You will be able to expand your business. Maybe you'll be able to work less, whatever your goals are. But um, with that said, thank you all for having me. Thanks for joining me. Um, I hope these help you all. Uh, I'll hang on here just for a few minutes if anybody wants to discuss anything else. But uh, on this short week, everybody have a great one. Um, be safe. And as we get into summer, I hope you all have a good COVID-free, normal summer. Normal summer. That's what I'm rooting for. So and I hope you are too. But see y'all.